welcome to episode two of MMA on Cage TV. I'm Ian M16 Butlin, joined again by Jamie the Haymaker Hay. Jamie, what have we got for viewers today? Well, today we've got special guest Neil Hall, referee in organisations such as Cage Warriors and the UFC. Jay Furness, another special guest as well, 11 wins in his pro career so far, and a top standout lightweight in the UK and Ireland. And also chatting with us later, we've got Yuri Lamaru, M1 Global judge, very, very good friend of mine, and he's going to be giving us a little bit of an insight into the M1 Global rules and the differences in Russia. Gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first official, Mr. Jay Furness. Thank you. Nice to feel wanted. <laughs> Welcome to MMA Uncaged. We've got Jay Furness here. Jay's going to fill us in a little bit on the rule changes. Obviously, we've just had the 23rd birthday of the UFC. Yeah, Doesn't seem like 23 years, does it, since we saw those, the, those first yeah. fights? Jay, how has things changed since the ninja versus jiu-jitsu and karate versus boxing well to me it's one of the, like the most fascinating stories in mma at the, at the start it was like the whole reason the whole point of the sport existing was this whole no one's bad there is no rules you know what i mean it pure spectacle and almost no sport um and the start of ufc won and if you look at every different strand you can go off and you can find different little things to talk about but ufc won actually started with uh, more stringent rules than, uh, and then actually came into play. And they said it was no rules, um, but it was like the gentlemanly, uh, no fingers in the eyes, yeah, no gouge in the eyes, no nut shots, um, and no biting, which was uh, pretty much the same rules as like the old Olympic pancreation. It's like, let's fight, but let's not like do the ungentlemanly stuff to each other sort of thing. Um, and as you look back at that, I mean, it was uh, Keith Hackney versus Joe's son, the infamous repeated punch in the testicles sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. So, you know, some of these rules were, were quite clearly flouted and, you know, some they stuck to. Uh, but at the start, the, the whole thing was trying to promote this This is no holds barred fighting. Um, because they're what they wanted. Yeah, so exactly. more, more guidelines in the rules, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, but everything was built to be a spectacle then, as opposed to now, you know, everything's promoted about the athletes, the sport, the skill. Yeah. Whereas then it was pure spectacle and... We all saw the one boxing glove. So it's yeah, like Art Jimerson, <laughs> the one <laughs> boxing glove. And, yeah. it were, uh, well, and they, they were talking about, um, you know, with regards to that, one of the initial rules that was actually there that people don't really know about, um, they tried to make it a rule that if you were doing a striking art, say if you were a boxer or whatever, um, you'd have to wear like the, the karate mitts similar to the MMA gloves okay. of today or the gloves. But no one did it, you know, because obviously you'd be at a bit, of, a bit of, a of a disadvantage. disadvantage. Yeah. Like I say, it was, it, was all, it was all pure spectacle because you look at how the, the cage came about, a couple of their first ideas for the cage were to have like alligators around the cage, to have the fence electrified. Yeah. <laughs> and they went to a guy from Hollywood to build the cage purely as a spectacle. And now we know the cage is actually something that makes MMA work, you know, much more so than a ringing to some degrees when guys are falling out with his limbs everywhere. Um, so it became something functional, but it was actually from a totally non-functional idea. Yeah. It was just, we've got a cage, this is crazy, cage fighting and... Yeah, it was like a big, big tall fence and like I say, it was, it was more of a pit. And the, the idea sort of moved on, and I think the WF tried Pit to actually fighting. nick it. Yeah they, yeah, they tried to nick the idea yeah. back in when Ken Shamrock went across, because that's what they perceived the idea as being. I think they had weapons in the cage and loads of it. It was, it was, it was a, a real spectacle yeah. from it. But yeah. that's, that's what the original, the original idea of it, I think, wanted to be a, a bit of a spectacle, didn't it? Like, rather than, than a, a professional fight. Yeah, of course. I, um, I think the original intention of the UFC was, you know, let's do a pay per view with this crazy thing, like no old bad fighting, and, you know, almost like a one and done. They had the success with the first one, and they're like, oh, you know, maybe we've got something here. Because I, I'd always thought that the, um, the UFC, obviously there was the um, Japan Valetuda were going on sort of simultaneously over in Japan, but it was more um, sort of brought in by the Gracie family to advertise their martial art, which is, um, yeah. which it, it did. And this is, like I say, you know, on every strand, there's lots of things you can talk about because there was a lot of um, controversy um, with regards to rules and refereeing, and a lot of that came back to Orion Gracie, who was obviously one of the co-founders of the UFC. Um, and one of the reasons he left when he, the, um, when he departed was they were instilling the time limits, which was obviously a big no-no for the Gracies. They were yeah. no time limit, no holes barred. To work their jiu-jitsu uh, in five minutes would be hard, especially against bigger opponents. Um, but 
as uh, like SEG and the guys there were pushing for rounds, you know, to try and make things yeah. a little more organised and a little bit more fan friendly, um, you know, Horan didn't didn't want that to happen. So that's where some of these risks started to occur. If you look at, I mean, it sounds yeah, this is great, no holds barred, no time limits. But there's some shockingly boring fights. UFC, yeah. UFC yeah. won, <laughs> luckily. None of the past went fights went past five minutes. Knockouts, like horrendous stuff going on. But you, there was fights. Um, was it Dan Seven versus Hoist? Yeah. You know, and yeah. like they literally are like the most boring fights you can imagine. Yeah. Um, some of the ones, Sakuraba, one of the most exciting fighters ever. But Sakuraba versus Hoist, it's like 90 minutes 90 long, minutes and of... almost nothing happened. Yeah. So you can understand why you know Horian wanted to protect what he had, which was jujitsu. He was trying to show jujitsu to the world. Um, but you know, you're trying to tread the line between spectacle and you know people stuff people want to watch and. For every event, there was little changes and there was back and forth. And, you know, what ended up ha happening was, you know, some people liked one, some people didn't like the other. Yeah. Uh, and they, it, the standardisation needed to come, you know. And when mean? did the unified rules come in? How did that come about? Uh, or what we now know as the unified yeah, rules? Yeah, what we now know as the unified rules. Um, well, Big John McCarthy got involved with the UFC from UFC 2 because mm. Horian didn't like actually one of the referees in UFC 1 stopped to fight when he wasn't supposed to. Right. It was supposed to be corners or knockout or whatever. Um, and Big John McCarthy came in at two where he was one of Horian's students. Um, and he came in and then him and uh, Jeff Blatnick uh, as a push to try and get things legalised in more states, you know, as it was getting blacklisted and yeah. blackballed all over the shop. Um, they wanted to try and bring in more standardisation and more rules so they could get uh, the commissions on board. And those two... Because they realised it was a moneymaker. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And, and McCarthy and Blatnick were the two guys who really pushed this forward and pushed for the some sort of standardisation. Because um, it was, at the time, it was like John McCain, I think he came out with the infamous human cockfighting phrase. Yeah. And he was, you know, yeah. so close to getting it totally banned well, across New York, every state. You know, we've only just seen the first one in New York for... 23 for years after it's 23, yeah, just 23rd birthday, and they finally get to, you know, Madison Square Garden, which is like the... the the sort of the fighting home yeah, outside of Vegas, capitalism. that is the, yeah, is the, is yeah. the fighting home. And, yeah. and without that kind of standardisation, I don't think it would have ever got there. And they were making incremental changes, sometimes like arbitrary changes between from event to event. I think it was UFC 9, they had um, the, the place where they had it, I can't remember, it might have been Colorado. Um, they said no, closed down the strikes, and I think they flouted it regardless. But from yeah. event to event, nobody really knew Same what, as the what was going to in Japan yeah. used to be yeah. Well, there used to be a lot of things with like you could wear wrestling boots in certain yeah. in certain states as well, wasn't there? Of course, yeah. in, in fights and that, that kind of stopped yeah. and got. And I think out. it was the uh, it was the New Jersey Commission um, actually. I think it was around 2001 that they put together the first sort of really well thought out um, rule set, which became like the founding of the uh, unified rules. Uh, you know. Every, you're looking at everything with regards to sort of attire, illegal strikes, what you can and can't do, uh, round times, corners, everything like that. And that's really where the process of standardisation uh, began. <coughs> the, the ABCs took it on um, whole board, uh, with everything in 2009-ish. So the New Jersey commissions and a lot of the commissions around the US had then started to use the unified rules anyway, yeah. but they became really much more recognised uh, in 2009 and now unified rules really is uh, probably 99% of MMA we see in the all, world. All you've, all you've got especially Europe and America, yeah. North America especially. Yeah, you've got, you know, Japan, it still does stuff, stuff different, um, Russia, and these other places. And to me, that's, you know, it's good. It brings a bit of flavour to the world of MMA, yeah, you know what I mean? But the unified rules now, uh, they're kind of taking over. And yeah. they, it's a blessing and a curse in a way because it's good. We hark back to pride and... Soccer kicks and everything, yeah. but then it was like pride of the good old days. That would have been the yeah. zenith. But everything's the good old days, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, But really, what we need is, um, you know, without the standardisation, the rule sets we had, we probably the UFC well, would have been dead pre 2000. So um, we've been fortunate that these things have come into play. Yeah. See, what people don't realise as well, just a quick mention on pride there. People, obviously, the way the UFC has gone now it is a lot about the money side of it. That was what pride was all about, really. It was about making money. They did have, you know, Rampage Jackson was brought in as a bit of a spectacle, wasn't he, really? Yeah. And, he's, and I think the way the UFC is now going, I think it is, it is becoming a bit more like Pride used to be, in, in my opinion. Not, well, not so much fight-wise, but the way the, a lot the, for the production the promotion, and the yeah. tradition. And, and th yeah. that's something I was going to say. You know, we've talked a lot about rules coming in for safety and for, um, 
um, for your know, fighters' benefits. I know with um, professional boxing, they changed it from 15 rounds to 12, and they started talking about sort of championship rounds and yeah. saying it was to do with safety. When it actually turned out, it was because with adverts, it fitted into an hour of TV. Yeah. Do you know, so it was a yeah. lot for the production. You know, so. Um, I was thinking the same with um, a lot of these things in the UFC. A lot of it is to do with the spectacle, you know. We change the rules that, um, you know, talk about the, the, the rule chairs that are coming in. Um, a lot of it is for the spectacle to keep the, the fight flowing and to make it good for the spectators because that's where the money comes from. Yeah, of course. And they, they're treading that line all the time. In the early days, they were treading the line between what can we get away with that will still allow us to put on shows, you know what I mean? Yeah. So they were putting rules in sort of begrudgingly a lot of the time just to cater to the athletic commissions to let them have them. But now, obviously, what they want is they want breaks in the pay-per-view where they can air their adverts, the big money spinners and whatever. And, uh, you know, they want every opportunity to monetize what they're doing. That's why a lot of the changes um, come from the top down. And that's why a lot of people take on the unified rules. It's what the UFC do. Imagine if the UFC did a different rule set and totally flouted the unified rules. You'd have a lot more promotions wanting to go down their route as well. Yeah. So, you know, they, they're leading the way of that yeah. uh, in those kind of terms. So imagine now, you know, having no time limit fights. Like, you've got two guys who are well matched and, you know, nullifying each other. And you see it a lot. One of the big rules that came in was obviously the referee's ability to stand people up. Yeah. And that is for nothing other than spectators. You know yeah. what I mean? So live spectators who were there or people watching on pay-per-view, that in a fight, it serves absolutely no function having a referee stand people up. Because yeah. in a fight, you know, the Gracie Seven, they're on the floor for 30 minutes with almost nothing happening. Seven inside Gracie's guard with yeah. no clue how to get out of it. And he's too big and too strong for Hoyce to submit him. But now, you know, after the first minute or so, the referee's going to stand him up. Yeah. And that's purely so the spectators get to see more action because yeah. at the same time as, you know, people but are becoming more... But you even hear the referee saying, more action, guys, yeah, more exactly. action. And, and, and really, you know, if we're talking purist-wise, a referee should never have that kind of input on a fight. The fight should be organic and go where it goes. But we also know that for it to be a business, for it to make money, to sell. people have to enjoy it, you know what I mean? So the rules have come in to cater purely to that as well. For entertainment. Yeah, I think I think I think them rules have helped as well. I think it's making people a bit more aware of what they need to do in the fight and track. I think you do get a lot more people, especially in the UK now, trying to finish fights. And especially in the amateur division now, you're seeing people really go for the finishes. I mean, again, go back to Antonio Sheldon. He didn't quite get the finish of the yeah. week, but the dominance and he was going for that finish constantly. Was he? he was going for the submissions. He was he was striking well. But I think the way that the, the rules have changed, I think it's really supporting the the fact of, of seeing knockouts and seeing finishes. Yeah, and uh, we'll talk to Neil um, about that after as well. But these the new changes that they're bringing in. Are I think these are all going to have a positive impact on this kind of thing as well. And the good thing about it is, you know, you look from UFC 1 to now, uh, you know, 23 years, so much has gone on. But now, the, uh, especially the UFC, but MMA as a whole has never been bigger. It's never yeah. reached more people. Yeah. And without these incremental changes moving in the right direction, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even be at this point, you know. Who knows where MMA would probably be now. Probably still be underground with a bunch of people swapping VHS tapes of each other or yeah, whatever, you exactly, know. Yeah. So, uh, in some ways, you get the purists saying, oh, yeah, this was the best way and all's bad. But we only have the sport we have today with the money it makes, putting people in jobs and fighters making millions, you know. Because of, yeah, because exactly of because of that. So, you know, for that reason, we've got to thank the rules and, yeah. you know, the founders of that, McCarthy, Blatnick. And we'll thank the rules for our thousands and millions we're making. That's it. That's <laughs> the one, yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Jay. Thanks for uh, your, your insight there with that. No problem. Pleasure. Cheers. Welcome back. Join us now in the studio is UFC referee Neil Hall and MMA legend and Huddersfield's finest man, Jay Furness. Neil Hall, Jay Furness, thank you very much for joining us on the couch here at MMA Uncaged. Great to be here. Obviously, you're both officials. Today, we're talking about officials and uh, rules in uh, MMA. Neil, um, you've refereed on the UFC, sort of reaching the pinnacle of a, a, a referee. And how's that feel? Uh, well, it's fantastic. Obviously, um, it's um, I've been refereeing ten years. Well, well, probably over ten years, as you know. Um, I think every referee would like to get to the UFC. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of good guys in the UK now. I'm sure that that will happen for them guys. But yeah, it's it's awesome. Do you think, with, with obviously, he was a fighter yourself, a yeah. professional fighter in MMA as well. Got 
again going back probably more than ten years now. But do you think that gives an edge to you as a referee having having that um, knowledge? Yeah, I mean that that sort of conversation has been had several times. Personally, I think it does help. So if not necessarily fighting MMA, but certainly training in certain arts, is going to give you an understanding yeah. of where the fighters are at mentally and also if you've got a good understanding of jiu-jitsu and stuff like that you can sort of see where the fight's going so i think it does help there are a lot of referees that haven't fought but i think I'd, if i had to yes or no i'd say yes yeah and how do you feel neil <coughs> uh, refereeing on the on the stage like the ufc has changed your game and do you think you've improved from doing that and un obviously you're under yeah. sort of scrupulous pressure yeah there is there is a lot of pressure i mean that's some that's i think that's probably the main difference for the guys that are working on um like regular shows, of course there's still pressure on those events, but once you get to an event like that, then yeah, the pressure's added on. It's how you deal with that pressure and not let that affect how you actually do your, perform your role. Um, so there's, there's a, an understanding of, um, of that pressure. You've got to be really on the ball. So you, you see everything's like, um, you're seeing everything like- Heightened. Heightened, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so then it, it helps you obviously throughout all your refereeing. Well, obviously, we, we all know that, um, I hope everyone at home knows there's going to be some big rule changes coming yeah. in. So I wanted you to, <coughs> to really explain the, the changes in the rules and, and how do you think that's going to affect the game? Yeah, um, well, the rules are going to come in January 1st, 2017, that's the first thing to say. And that's for all shows? Well, I mean, yeah, I'm, we're certainly going to do that. Yeah. Um, most of the states in the, U, in the US. Everyone uses the unified rules. Commission, the commission's there. Yeah, there are, the New Jersey are a little bit, um, out, which we might cover in a, in a second, but generally speaking, everyone's going to be going on to those rules, yeah. January 2017. So they were discussed, passed by the ABC, as we know. Um, there are a couple of ones I'll mention later on that didn't get through, that will be looked at later on. So <coughs> there, are, there are sort of five main changes for referees. Um, the judging's changing a little bit as well, so we'll have a look at that. The first thing to say for the, for the uh, referees, well, for the fighters, actually, yeah. You've got five. The first one, the down opponent. That's the big one everyone's talking about. Um, before, we've had a lot of instances where fighters are doing what everyone's calling playing the game. So the, it's, they've been allowed to have their fingertips on the ground, on and off. We see John Jones do that. This, a bit. He comes yeah. out dragging his yeah. hand. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it makes it tough on for the referee to decide what's going on, doesn't it, as well? It's well. tough for the referee. The other fighter's waiting. He's wanting to throw that knee. It's confusing. Yeah. Um, it's playing the game, we don't know what Get, that is. The gamesmanship. The yeah. gamesmanship, yeah. So th it's been changed, well it's going to be changed in January. What they're saying now, and I like this rule actually, uh, two fists or palms have to be down for you to be a down fighter. So not even a fingertip? Not a fingertip. Right, okay. okay. So yeah. it has to be a palm or a fist yeah. touching the floor, both. Don't forget, any other part of your body touches the ground, the soles of your feet, you're still down. Yeah. Okay, so if you've got a knee and a hand, you're down. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this is where we want to avoid any confusion. All right. So that because there's always going to be loopholes everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And if someone's going to find it, a fighter's going to find a loophole somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So let's cut that out straight away. Okay. Any other part of your body touches the floor, you're still down. Okay. So it's not just the two hands. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So if so you've got if a knee one, and a hand, one knee down. Yeah. So like, like it's always been. So say someone that that is a down. You're a down fighter. It? Right. Okay. But if you had if you had one hand down as well. Yeah. Some people are going to say, well, it's two hands. Right. Yeah. No, you've got your knee down. So you yeah. So it has down. to be the yeah. knee and the hand as well. Any anything but the soles of your feet. Yeah. Touch yeah. the ground. Yeah. yeah. Right. But if it's only the hands only, yeah, right, it has okay. to be yeah. both. Yeah. So it's got to be fist off. Palm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So cool. If nothing else is touching but the hands, both clearly. So that's that's rule number one. That's rule number one. That's the big one. An illustration. Yeah. Obviously, it's this. Yes. Then it'd have to be this or this. That's, that's yeah. what we're looking yeah. at. It'll, it'll, it'll yeah. prevent the play in the game situation. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, there's always going to be some. I mean, uh, I think it was John Kavanaugh I was talking to, and they, they found a loophole in the in the one thing. What they did was, and it became a white belt novice came to the gym, and he instantly just said this thing, and John was like, genius. <laughs> said, what, is, <laughs> said, what they've done, what? All, all they did was they trained the fighters, and the guy's got the hand down to sort of lift the guy up so his hands come off and then yeah. knee him in the head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. like the fact that they're yeah. always going to find some yeah. kind of loophole. Perfect sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, um, but for now, I think this is a good thing. Yeah. Because uh, it's very clear. Two hands down. Yeah. yeah. Next one. Um, obviously, we, we've talked about the down the down opponent. Um, the, there's five, as I said. The, the small ones are grabbing, grabbing the clavicle. I've never seen that happen. Mm. 
the only two reasons you could do that, one would be for purchase, but then it's, it's slippy. Yeah. And the other one is, um, it's an old jiu-jitsu on out like combat a, thing where if you shove your fingers down, pressure it, point, it hurts. Sort of, yeah. But I've never, never seen that. No. The heel kicks the kidneys. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, you can strike using other weapons to the kidneys. So why not? The yeah. Heel kicks the kidneys. So that makes sense to me. So they're yeah. adding that into it. So you're out. That's going to come okay. here. So you will yeah. be allowed the heel kicks the kidneys. Right, so they took that gap. rule out of the yeah. 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 So that, that was a big thing in the Sean mm -hmm. Lomas Matt Inman fight. Yeah, uh, exactly. Recently, wasn't it? Sorry, Sean Lomas, um, Alex Minogue. Alex Minogue. Yeah, yeah that's where right. He, was, uh, he, was, he dropped a lot of he did. Uh, yeah. heel kicks to the, to the he kidneys, does. and he thought it was uh, at the time legal when he wasn't. Yeah. But I know he aims a lot to the sort of legs and, yeah. and, the, and, the, and the back. He lost. I think but he lost six points in that fight. Because I think my brother had to referee that fight. Yeah, yeah. A very tough fight yeah, to referee. Yeah, I think he lost six points because <laughs> of it. Because he, yeah. he kept getting told and told and told. He was lucky to not get disqualified because yeah. of that. But obviously, next year that'll, uh, that would change the game. For yeah. Like yeah. A, but I think, I think, you know, bring it in, it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, it's an So all these thing. seem to be new rules that are just to keep the fight flowing more. Keep the fight flowing. Yeah, so there's less of a sort of a hindrance and a stoppage. Yeah. 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 Obviously, they've got the, um, for the girls, for the females, um, they've now got to wear the sports bra or a tight-fitting rash guard. Right, yeah. Whereas before, they've been allowed to, to wear more loose sort of tops. Well, if you gave all, all of us a grappling, you've got, I've had a toe caught in a yeah, in, in, in loose pants, there's something, there's nothing, you know. Yeah. In someone's pocket. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these, thing, these things happen. So, yeah. I mean, these, these things are coming in yeah. um, January. Um, there were a couple of other things as well. I mean, the uh, the downward elbow discussed. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Now the the rules and regulations body actually cleared that and, and said let's let's include that now. Mm -hmm. Let's include the downward. Yeah, elbow. Yeah, we can do every single six. slight angle apart yeah. from that. And they talked about weight brackets. Adding and more. so, so angle, sorry, yeah. going back to the to the elbow. So, I mean, you can't do it exactly downward elbow. Yeah, but you can do any other slight angle. So why That's are they right. still keeping it out? If, if, well, and especially if it's been passed. yeah, because as I said, the the, um, the rules and regs guys, the committee, John McCarthy, all and kind of people, mm, yeah. they discussed it thoroughly. They all thought, let's let's bring this in. Yeah. It's time to do that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm saying with the adding more weight brackets, yeah. that were discussed and approved. Yeah. But when it got to the medical board. They've knocked it back. Right, okay. See, yeah. the, the, that, that surprised me. The medical board the knocking the weights back. I mean, for the fact that you add more weights in, there's, yeah. there's going to be less a sort of injury from the weight cuts. I think, I think, yeah. I think they're wanting some kind of report or evidence. Mm. So I know, I know with the elbows, they're talking about doing um, like a pilot run. Now they're getting five or six commissions yeah. to, to, to run it for, right. yeah, it I sense. don't know, however long, a set piece of time, and then gather data from that and then yeah. present that to the medical board. Well, it's good again. to see from my point of view, like, look, you know, looking at the sport, it just shows the sport is progressing, they're trying to change, it yeah. trying to make it, what, what, obviously they've got to make it a spectacle, but as safe as possible. And I think they, they, they're getting the right balance, I feel, especially yeah. with these new additions. You know, I think, I think that, and, that, and that will be reviewed again when it comes around in next year, because the, the, the regular body's already agreed on that. If they gather some data, present it to the medical people, yeah. I, think, I think certainly the elbow thing will be passed. Yeah. The weight thing should be seriously looked at, and Definitely, perhaps yeah. that's going to get passed. They're even talking about having like instant replays. Um, Again, perhaps having you agree with, isn't it? It's yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. it's helpful. I mean, it, you know, in you know, other sports, rugby everywhere, yeah. you know, football, especially so, for the near the down opponent. That, yeah, that's yeah. one point where you think you'd, that you know the instant replay could have helped you it, loads it, of times. It could, help, it could help a lot of times. Also, um, the, even maybe having extended rounds. They're talking about that. So there's all kinds of things. But, in the sort of like talked about in, in the, behind the scenes, yeah. That make I mean, the sport's progressing, it's only fairly new, yeah. The rules 23 are years old, to was adapt. it last week? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously, the other thing with the uh, the new changes coming in is the eye pokes, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, oh, that's right, the big okay, thing. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, with every referee I know has had that, this, you know, some fighters they just train that way, a lot of Thai fighters, especially, but not you know, fingers are going out. Yeah. You know, I mean that that's that's a solid thing to go yeah, in mind. Yeah. yeah, and the amount yeah. of ones we've seen some pretty yeah. bad ones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so oh yeah, yeah. So I mean some of the damages from it as well are horrendous, aren't they? You know. That it's, yeah, it's I mean I know a guy severe. personally and he, he's he's had a lot of problems from it. He's, yeah. he, his eyeball got turned. Ugh. Oh, the wow. finger went in underneath and it turned it. Try not to make anyone sick. Which is a warning <laughs> yeah, sorry, before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At least we didn't put a picture yeah. up on the back. Yeah, but it's a, that, it's a good, it presents a good case to, to yeah. say oh, we, need, we need to get on top of this. Um so you know, we've been, when we work on the USC, the guys are instructed already yeah. to talk about this with the fighters before the fight even happens. So in the locker rooms, we're now instructing the fighters that we want to see the thing 
point. See I think if you uh, right, yeah. on the Alvarez uh, McGregor fight that we've just seen this weekend, I think pretty much everyone in the sports watch that. Yeah. Um, if you, I, I read through the um, the corner work from John's team and then um, from the Alvarez team, yeah. and you actually get um, John McCarthy came between rounds and spoke yeah. to John's corner and said to McGregor, just watch out for the fingers. This is it. Um, yeah. You know, so obviously you see, and McGregor is one who can. Yeah, he is. He's, he's yeah, a he does. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what? There's going to be because he's a striker using <coughs> that, that so distancing. Many fight, there's so many fighters are going to have to really look at that. So what sort of penalty because, are we talking for it though? Well, up until now, we've not been allowed to take any points off yeah. it, but we've been instructed to sort of be heavy on the warnings and, and, okay. and make yeah. people aware of it. But as of January, we will be allowed to take a point off. So it could be a two yeah. point every time as well. If, if, it if could it be. On. I mean, you know, it's as we discussed and I mentioned the example earlier. It's, it's a dangerous thing. Yeah. Um, the nature of the sport, the gloves that we that we've got. Yeah. You know, the fingers are out there. Well, let's be honest. A lot of the John Jones's fights, where, where, yeah. where he tried to palm off, he's doing it on purpose. He is purposely pushing off with his fingers the, and trying to cause a bit of trauma because you're not going to get done for it. This he's is, playing the game yeah. again, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. Playing. That's a good. Yeah. yeah. Playing the game is a good way of yeah. putting it again. So we don't need to get on top of it. So fighters out there, you want to start training now. Get their fingers up. Yeah. Yeah, the thing about that is in the training as well, not only is this happening in the fights, but it's a bit wider reaching for a fighter because obviously you're training a lot of your striking in big gloves where you're not particularly thinking about the angle of your fingers. And, and so, you, to, yeah. so then you have to redo your training mechanisms and how you're yeah. dealing with it. Maybe training more in the little gloves the so you're used to it. Ready, yeah. But you do most of your like boxing, kickboxing, sparring, big gloves where you're not consciously thinking about it and you might parry like this. Yeah. So guys now have got to start training in the right way, training yeah. more in the Correct. MMA gloves and doing it. So it's like from the ground up, everybody has really got a fit of notice to it. I that. think they could, you can do it in your shadow boxing to start with. You start shadow yeah. boxing, you start purposely getting the fingers up. So you're yeah. throwing jabs out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm making sure that if you're, if you're measuring or palming, yeah. that the fingers are up. Yeah. You know, it's, it's going to happen, it's going to come in, and yeah. it's going to take some transition, and there's going to be a lot of fighters not happy when they're losing points. But no. don't well, John Jones message, could ever you know? sort his personal life out. He's got a lot to think about, hasn't <laughs> yeah. he? Yeah, yeah, he's got a lot <laughs> yeah. to think. Yeah. So I mean, those are the main, those are the main sort of things. The, the judges think quickly. If we've got time to cover that very quickly. Yeah. Um, again, I'm not a judge, as you know. Um, it's not my thing. But what I understand about it is that they're, they're looking to encourage more ten eight rounds. Right. Yeah. To utilise that more, and I think what, what they're saying is that the criteria has always been and still remains. Um, for the judges to review, to have effective striking and grappling. Yeah. Okay. We've all yeah. we know that. Yeah. But a lot of people talked about damage and this and other. Okay. So effective striking, effective grappling. Those are the first things that still have to be weighed. Still the number one. Right? Yeah. But let's say those things are equal. Yeah. Where does the judge go next? Yeah. So next they go to aggression. Right. So there are three things that come under the aggression. I use the word damage for the moment. Damage duration and dominance so those yeah. things come under the aggression bit yeah now just on the damage thing the terminology is being changed again it was new jersey state in new jersey that weren't happy about the word <coughs> and they went away and they reviewed it and they've come back with the word impact so impact. they're using impact okay. instead of damage behind closed doors the judges are going to talk about damage because that's an easy thing to understand yeah but they know that the, the correct terminology is going to be impact yeah okay so if you've got there are three things there in the aggression just quickly, if the aggression's equal, then they go to cage control last. Right. Okay. But let's come back to the aggression. There are three three things there. If two of those things are sort of dominant and equal, yeah. Okay. Then a ten eight should be considered. Right. Okay. okay. So okay. if you're dominant and you've had the duration, then the ten eight is going to be considered. Or if you're dominant, you've had the most. The, yeah. Yeah. The if impact. You, if you've had all three, then. It, it really should be. Then a it's a pretty much common that's difference, what saying. Okay. And another interesting point, quickly, is that the the impact as well. What they're saying again for fight. This is all good for fighters to know now. Okay. The thing about the impact, they're, they're counting um, severity over accumulation. Right. So if you if you've jabbed me twenty times. Yeah. But I I give you a couple jab, of yeah. big right, <laughs> I, I give you a couple of big right hands and invisibly. Yeah. Rock the, rock someone, they're yeah. going to weight the bigger shots against right, the accumulation. Is the, yeah, so that is a, bl a, a yeah. bit That's of a change. That's an important thing. Yeah, yeah, that is very important. It's yeah, important. because a lot of the time after fights at the minute, people are talking about, yeah, but you landed 30 more shots than him. Yeah, but yeah. Where are the effective? Yeah, yeah were the effective. How effective and were, and were, were they? Yeah. Topically, like um, Rosa Pimblet this weekend, maybe. So yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Like the guy who's done damage, dropping him, causing severe damage. Uh, you know, because now people go to the compu and a ten-eight round would have made a big yeah, difference if that people last go to compu stats and things like that, and 
you know, the stats don't necessarily tell a story. Yeah, true. Um, the same as, like I say, they call it impact for PC value. But It's more palatable. And, it, yeah. yeah. and this yeah. is what you've got to say. I think a lot of guys at home that watch the fights at the weekend, which I think is a very good example, yeah. who don't understand the score and are like, oh, well, do you know what? Um, yeah. Paddy, Paddy could have lost that fight, for example. But obviously we know from the scoring criteria, no, well, do you know what? I think the scoring was quite, quite yeah. good. I, I yeah, pretty much agree with it. Yeah, However... With the new scoring criteria, I would score yeah. a fight completely different. Yeah. It would be. And, it's, and that's why I think, you know, I, I was asked uh, my opinion on, um, on the scoring of the fights. I said, you know what, I can't really give you an opinion because I watched it as a fan. Yes. And I watch it very differently yeah. when I'm watching as a judge. Ian, Ian, do you know what? I get that all the time. Ref people say to me, how did you judge? Listen, our referee. In I a wasn't fight. watching yeah, it as a, a judge, yeah, and and, and, yeah. and guys at home were having a beer yeah. and are giving their yeah. massive opinion on Facebook, and it's like, yeah. wait a minute, I wasn't watching, it and, yeah. I, and I do that for a job. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? So it's I think it's you've it's got to boxing, understand. Though. It's got to be, you've got to be fight, scoring that fight to that criteria. To that criteria, yeah. and that, uh, obviously, any judges, if I've got it slightly wrong, correct me, please. But as far as I understand it, that's where we're going with the, with the judging. Yeah. So that the ten eight, it's much more. Um, you know, this is fighters beware. You know, you need to start training yeah. now for yeah. the things. So you that lose are a ten eight in. round, you've got a lot of work to it's do a, in a three round fight. Ten eight rounds are killer, man. You know, you need to yeah. you need to think about that and how so again, just to uh, sort of that point, it's not the accumulation, it's it's a couple of big damaging shots in there yeah. are going to take precedence over the, the accumulation. It's what happens in boxing though, isn't it? If you yeah. go to boxing, you, you could yeah. land 40, 40 yard punches to, to two, but then two yeah. punches, did you get one knockdown yeah. and you've won the round. Yeah, you've got a 10-8 you, you, you yeah. round on that because you got the knockdown and that's what that's tends right. to happen yeah. a lot in boxing. And if, I think it's a good thing to bring into it because I think a lot of the time it, it's not sh the damage isn't being shown on the on the scorecards no. because it's not supposed to be <coughs> at the no. minute. And that, that's what people aren't understanding. I, yeah, I, I and agree. again, damage is a, it's one of those words where you can see visible damage on someone's face, but not internally. Yeah. Guys that are getting well, liver shots and yeah. that's, look, look at the know, Antonio Sheldon fight. Yeah, Antonio fought against Lister, didn't he, in, in, in his fight uh, for the title at ICE. And he got a lot of cuts on his face, but absolutely plastered him in the fight. So he, yeah. he, he won the fight by a mile, but yeah. his face looked a mess afterwards. Yeah. But if you watch it back, he landed the better shots. Yeah. He, landed more, just yeah. he, he cuts Cost. easier. <laughs> that's well, yeah, and, 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 and so this is the thing. Yeah. You, some people are more susceptible people, for yeah, it. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's one of those things. So a quick summary on that then is that for the, for the judging, still effective striking uh, and grappling is going to be weighed first. So that what you're going to be looking at. Obviously, if that's going to be equal, then they're going to go to the aggression, which are the three things. The, uh, the damage, the impact, sorry, uh, the dominance and the duration, and then finally the cage control. If I were fighting, I'd be looking at all these things and I'd be training. It's, when you're fighting someone, you shouldn't be just going there, how can I win this fight? What, yeah. I want to use every tool possible yeah. to me. So it's not just in these. And coaches yeah. should be conscious it, of that as well when absolutely. they're making the game plan. Yeah, it's yeah. understanding. I understand the rules. I know how to win this fight. If I yeah. can't put the guy down or tap him out, I need to understand what the judges are looking for. Now, yeah. Jay, obviously, you're a referee yourself. You're obviously still a fight, an active fighter as well. What are your thoughts Someone. on the new... Yeah, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> what, are, what are your thoughts on the new rule set? Do you think it'll, it'll help as a referee? Yeah, for me personally, uh, I mean, the fight rules or the judging? Yeah, no, the, the fight rule, the, the referee and sort of signing. Yeah, so. yeah. I think the, the good thing about those for referee and fighter are that it's eliminating a lot of the grey areas. Mm. You know what I mean? The, there are certain parts which are kind of arbitrary that lead to the grey areas, like the hand on the ground yeah. and whatever. Mm. And you've got to put yourself in the mind of a fighter. You know, when you're in a fight, it's intense. Everything's rushing by. You know, your emotions are... So, like, focused on what you're doing, trying to fight your opponent, you know, it's very intense. Like, these little minuscule rules about, you know, is, is his finger slightly touching or is it a millimetre off? Yeah. It needs to be much less subtle than that because in a fight, uh, very, very black it's, and hard, white. it's hard to stay on top of these kind of things. <coughs> yeah. So I think the better, both for the fighter and for the referee, because, you know, now we've got a, a firm ground. It's a lot more clear yeah. cut. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with you know, the rule change, I think I they're do. better. And when they, if they eventually bring the 12-6 in as well, I think that's even better because, yeah. again, it's just these areas where we've got, is it, isn't it, you know, the grey areas. It's them arguments yeah, between we're the just, corner we're just and the referee at the end of a fight. Always. Just we're just eliminating them yeah. bit by bit, which should make it easier um, for fighters to just be able to go out there and fight. And if you fight clean and you're not an idiot doing, it's, it's, It'll make it harder to do things accidentally wrong, yeah. if you know yeah. what I mean, yeah. for a fight. Yeah. Of course, yeah. 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 Which they pay, they pay the penalty for. Yeah, course, Sometimes, yeah. you know, when it could have been trained out of it. Obviously, yeah. you've, you've been around the game a long, long time yeah. now. What are your thoughts on the way the amateur sort of fighting is going at the minute? Because, I mean, it seems to be bigger than it's ever been in, in the UK. 
I'm loving it. I love the amateur fights. Um, there's some really talented amateur fighters out there. Um, obviously, slightly off, but on the, on the IMAF thing, I mean, globally, amateur MMA is just huge. Yeah. Do you, do you agree with the shin guards? That's, I that, do in that's a tournament I format. Agree with. In a tournament format, I do. Because, yeah. again, it's accumulation of damage. Well, yeah. I, fought, I fought in the tournament before, obviously, yeah. uh, US, professional, yeah, yeah, and, um, on Cage Warriors, and I got a bad lump on my shin in the first fight. Yeah. Exactly. The, and, and it does call it, well, it, it changes the game for, yeah. the, next, for the next fight. So I, 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 think, so I, think, I think if it were just a one amateur yeah, fight amateur, on, yeah. a, on like a local show, then maybe not, you so know. But m- myself and Jay went over to Denmark earlier this year, and obviously yeah. you, you didn't have to get to referee the fights because of the commission over there yeah. didn't allow, allow you, did they? But what, what the, the thoughts on the, the shin guards over there was, was quite, they, they seemed to like it, didn't they, the, the Danes? They seemed to. Yeah, I mean, they like it. For me, I think it presents um, quite a lot of problems, entanglements, and um, obviously, especially for the grappling, I think it presents a lot of problems. But I agree, you know, for the amateurs, safety's primary. And if you wanted them to fight again the next day and again the next day, it, I've been out for nearly 10 months with a shin injury from yeah. my last fight. So I know yeah. full well that these things can happen. Bad news, shin injury. You know, for amateurs, really, what we need to do is keeping them as safe as possible, as injury-free as possible, um, and as active as they can be to yeah. keep going. Uh, and whether, yeah, there's some things that you have to work around, and it's not always going to be ideal. No. But I think if safety is at the forefront of your of your thoughts, then I think that's probably the right a, thing. A quick point on the shin pads as well. If the, if it's if they've got good quality shin pads, yeah. that uh, everyone's wearing the same, and the stand and the, the close fitting, the yeah. like I am off. Yeah. They're, they're all provided, okay? And all these shin pads, you know, they're slim, they're thin, you can still work, but they're all well fitted. You don't want to turn up at an unregulated show yeah. where he's got some twins tie boxing yeah, shoes yeah, on and course. he's yeah. got some yeah. points, elasticator thing. No, no, no. Yeah. But if they're all the same all uniform, and they're good yeah. quality and they're fitted, well, yeah. I guess that's, you know, that's the way I go. On the same line as that, the, the other bane in your life must be the amateur gloves because the yeah. differentiation between it's, amateur gloves is, is quite quite. It's big, the design it? that's, that's, yeah. that's the problem. I mean, obviously, it's the weight that, that, that we're looking at. Yeah. Six ounce, seven ounce, up to eight. Um, but it's the shape. All the manufacturers are making the gloves now the same, well, most of the farm manufacturers making the gloves the same shape as the four ounce. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and some of them are putting all the weight on the back. In the, at the back. So the, the padding on the knuckles is not much more than the four ounce. Yeah. Now, again, un- until you get a regulation where everyone have to wear the same ones, it's a problem. What would help is the manufacturers put stamped on the weight on the glove as well, because yeah. you've got one glove and it says seven ounce on it, and you've got one, it doesn't say anything. You know the referees, it's hard, the, yeah, the, the officials. Are, if you've got a, if you've got a regulated show, the gloves are provided. It's not a problem. Yeah. Okay, but there's a lot of shows that don't work that way, as we know. Um, there's all kinds of gloves going around, so it's difficult. Yeah. You know. Okay. Well, mainly, like I said, the rule changes that was very, very interesting, and it was. Um, oh, it's good to have the insight from someone you know at your level, Neil. So really appreciate, I appreciate you coming that, down. Yeah. I appreciate the um, opportunity. Yeah. And I hope the guys at home can sort of learn from from what's been said, yeah. um, and and work towards that. So thank you very much, Neil Hall, Jay Furness. Thanks, mate. Really Thanks. enjoyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce my good friend and M1 Global judge, Yuri Lamaru. Yuri, thank you for coming on MMA on Cage TV. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Really happy to be here with you. Well, actually over the internet, but... <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's as good as it can be. Yuri, I want to ask you about, firstly, you know, we've had some great experiences with M1 and it's hard for people maybe at home to understand the spectacle that M1 put on. Could you maybe give them a little bit of an example of, uh, of one of the shows that we've been at? For sure, I can give you one. Uh, it's a very impressive one because it was an incredible work of uh, logistics from the part of uh, M1 Global. They held uh, an event, uh, initially I think it started in 2012 and it was in the middle of the mountains. It was really in the middle of nowhere in the mountain in the city or uh, Republic of Russia called Ingushetia. So they had to bring uh, not only the, uh, the fighting surface, uh, which is the rage at the time, I think they were using a, or a simply a ring. Uh, and to bring this in the mountain, plus to bring all the camera equipment for the TV uh, that was transmitted on the Russian national TV, that was incredibly a lot of work. Uh, also bringing the lights and bringing everything to make sure that the transmission would show the uh, amazing view that was there. And uh, that was an incredible event. But it, it was also a very special uh, thing to visit this place because before going there, 
I looked on the uh, government website of Canada. I did the I same thing. Canada, you <laughs> and I was worried, okay, is this place safe to go? And they say, well, the uh, government of Canada suggests that you don't go there because if something happens, we're not bringing you back. The British, so said, okay, the, the British government once said the same. Thing. Yeah. I didn't tell that to my mother at first. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we arrived at the airport over there. Everything was w w went well with the flights. And uh, the Prime Minister of Sports is there to uh, welcome us and to greet us. I'm thinking, wow, this is really, really impressive, really nice. And we get in the car and there's a machine gun in the car. <laughs> so I'm thinking, wow, this is interesting. <laughs> and the driver is like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he opens the machine guns and he's like, yeah, it's fully loaded, like just in case. I'm thinking, <laughs> okay. So we start on the car ride. It's a two hour car ride. And in front of us, there's a police car escorting us. And we go through military checkpoint after military checkpoint after military checkpoint until we finally reach the hotel. And then the next day, we did uh, maybe an hour car ride in the mountain, uh, very, uh, uh, very the, the, the abruptness uh, of the mountain was really impressive and really scary at the same time. Yeah. And uh, I read online that the, this republic uh, went through a bomb attack uh, in 2009 or something. So we were there three years uh, after this. And we arrive at the show and I'm sitting for my judging duties and uh, the seats behind me are empty until the show starts. And guess who's the person sitting just behind me? The president of the Republic who <laughs> suffered a bomb attempt and survived three years ago. And yeah. if something happens, I'm going to be right there in the middle of the explosion. Right next to an assassination attempt. Yeah, exactly. But in the end, everything went well. And their first show was really amazing. And uh, I'm not sure how many thousands of people they had, but over the course of three years, uh, they broke a record of the highest assistance in Russia. They had over 23,000 people that's for right. an outdoor show. I, I joined you for the, uh, for, the, for the second show, and that's where they broke the record, wasn't it? 23,500 people, which was... To, to be It's hard to describe it if you weren't there. It was unbelievable, wasn't it? Yes, definitely. And they even had hot air balloon flying in the backgrounds in the mountains, and just the view uh, of the green mountains and... Uh, they had like some sort of like towers or castle that were a little bit like Game of Thrones like. Yeah. So the, the atmosphere around it was definitely incredible and never seen anywhere else. I think for the TV, it was the most beautiful show that had been uh, portrayed. Yeah, I, I've, I've said that a few times. I think the production on M1 is second to none. It's just unbelievable. There's nothing like it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I think what is really good uh, for, for uh, the, the video part of what they do is that they really try to uh, to introduce you the fighters. They want to make you care about the fighters so that when the, the personality fight stops, that you're invested in seeing one of them win or lose, depending on their personality and their skills. And I think that's a good thing that they do from there. And their video thing is out of this world. It's really good. Now, now Yori, obviously, it's, a lot of people are talking about the UFC and things like Bellator. Now, M1's been around a good few years now. Just gives a little insight to what M1 is and what it represents around the world. Um, I, I think uh, for when, when we talk about M1, uh, most of the, the fights used to be everywhere in the world. Now it's more focused uh, in Russia, uh, but they also have events uh, in Kazakhstan, in uh, Azerbaijan, and uh, also in China and other countries that I probably forget. Uh, but in terms of, um, of importance for the world of MMA, I think uh, it's really one of the biggest organizations that's currently uh, that, that you can view right now. But the thing is that not many people know about it. And for me, it always surprised me when I go see their show, the level of their fighters. Any of those fighters uh, could be fighting for Bellator or for the UFC. And actually, some of them are now in the UFC. Uh, so I think level-wise, their guys are really up there uh, on par. And, yeah, I mean, uh, as, it's as, not as sport. Any... I think that they're on national TV. I think uh, that in Russia, this is the biggest organization. Um, so, Yuri, obviously we're looking at, at the moment, uh, officials today um, here in the uh, MMA Uncaged. Could you tell us a little bit about the judging? Because obviously the judging scoring people at home might not know is slightly different in, um, in Russia and on M1. Could you tell us the scoring criteria? How is the scoring criteria done for, for uh, a fight in Russia? Uh, yes, definitely. I think, uh, first of all, maybe I could touch the rules just very quickly. I think most of the rules are the same as the uh, unified rules. The only exception I think noticeable to me, uh, and I'm not a referee, but I still know a little bit uh, the rules as part of being a judge, 
uh, is that they don't allow uh, elbows to the head. And the main reason for this is uh, due to the, uh, the cuts uh, that are suffered more often with elbows. Uh, so they, they, they don't allow these elbows to the head and the blood on national TV doesn't look really good. So most of the time what they do is that if the fighter is too bloody, it's possible that they might interrupt the fight. Uh, we've, seen li we've seen it a lot in the past, less now, and they will just clean the fighters and then keep on with the fight. Um, in terms of the judging criteria, it's also quite similar, but also a little bit different. So of course they have the effective striking, uh, effective grapplings, um, and they will have, where it comes different is then they will have a four to finish the fight, which could be a little bit like uh, aggression. Um, and they will count in this, uh, okay, well, when the fighter is in difficulty, will the opponent uh, really tries to go for a finish or will it be more conservative? Yeah. Uh, they will also include the damage. So visible damage to the body due to a blow. Uh, and I think this is something, maybe Neil can uh, correct me, but I think this is something that wanted to be applied with the new uh, ABC rules. Uh, the only thing is I think they changed the word damage for impact. That's right. Yeah. Just discuss that. Ma then, maybe yeah. Neil can come here and add a little bit uh, more that's, about that, this. Yeah, that's what um, Neil, Neil's just said that to us, and that's pretty much exactly as you said. Yeah, so they're bringing in what, what, the U, uh, what M1 have always had, which yeah. is the, the, they're calling it impact, but it's damage, um, mm. as you say, yeah. Oh. This is one of the other criteria, and the other one, uh, the last one uh, that they use for the judging is the uh, takedown. So they will count the takedown, uh, and uh, if the uh, if the uh, the person that executes the takedown gets into an advantage position, and uh, what he does from there. Uh, so these are the main criteria that are being used. Uh, for me, I think it's different. I cannot say if it's better or 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 worse. I think it's just simply different, and uh, you just have to get used to it as a judge. Uh, wherever you go, I always reread the rules every time to make sure that I I have the right set uh, to rely on. So, Fingers or Yuri, does does that not make it, it, it quite hard for the guys that go over to to uh, to fight an M1 that are from like say England or from from the from the European sort of part of the world? It, it, would that make it a lot more difficult for them to fight over there because of the rule set? Well, the, uh, the fact that they're not aware of the yeah. rule set, the different rule set. Uh, yes, definitely. I think uh, for the fighters and for the coaches, it's very, very important that they read the rules every time where they, when they fight in a different country where not necessarily the same rules apply. And even uh, for the fighters and the coach, I would even go further than this. As a judge, we have to, uh, to get the technical knowledge and the practical knowledge of fighters. For us, it's important that we train or that we have at least experienced it to be able to judge a fight correctly. Well, I think for the fighters, if they want to know the best way that the judging works, is that maybe they should also uh, read the rules. Maybe they could go even as far as getting certified just to make sure that they really uh, understand and that they can fight in consequences and make sure that they don't get robbed uh, because they didn't know the rules or they yeah, get definitely. found for something that they could have avoided. So, Yuri, we, we've got Jay Furness here, who's um, a, he's a referee over here, but he also fights international. Jay, with what Yuri's just said there, um, do you think coaches and fighters should be looking at the rule set and the different scoring criteria and training for that scoring criteria in their fight camp leading up to a fight in Russia? Yeah, completely. It, no matter where you're fighting, so the rule set you're fighting under, you should be very au fait with it and au fait with how the judges are scoring it. Um, me personally, um, I've gone on courses with obviously Matt Goddard, who's one of the top referees in the world, purposely. So, you know, I'm not a judge. I have judge fights, but very rarely. Um, I'm not a judge, but I wanted to learn the criteria, how they were applied, why they were applied. So then, yeah. you know, as a fighter, as a coach, you know, you can pass this experience on. The amount of times I see, you know, corner men in between rounds and they're talking about, you know, oh, you're two rounds up when they're clearly not. Like that kind of ignorance doesn't help anyone. If anything, you know, the fighter, you know, it harms the fighter. So you definitely need to be uh, looking at the rules. And if you can, like Yuri says, if you can get certified so you know that you know the rules. You know exactly you know, what definitely. you're fighting. Yeah. And yeah. If, you, if you're going abroad, like, things are crazy enough anyway, um, you know, with flights and whatever, new foods and when you're trying to cut weight and stuff. So then if you're throwing into the mix, like, different rule changes that you that are surprising you out of the blue that you only find out on the it's, day it's totally only your own fault and it you know so, they, yeah. it's all part of your preparation to be able to <clears> fight and if you don't do it i'd say you know lackadaisical maybe or stupid most likely 
You see, you're, it's a very interesting point what you made there, actually. And it, so, is it, with with the M1 style and the, the judging, have you got to have had a background in fighting? Then is that like a uh, something that you've got to have on your resume before you you join up to be a, yes, uh, like a judge? Definitely. Uh, if I can be honest, I'm not uh, a good fighter, and that's probably why I never fought. But uh, I trained uh, Jiu Jitsu and I trained Muay Thai. Yeah. And uh, after I think it was one year of training both uh, disciplines, then I decided, okay, then I'll try to, to switch completely to full MMA training. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I also really hated it. I re that's when I realized that it was really not for me. But the hmm. experience that I've got doing it, I think it helped me a lot to understand the sport. And if you've never been there, you don't understand sometimes how difficult some of the small things or the things that you don't think uh, need so much energy, how grueling they can be and how difficult it can be sometimes to just escape a position. Sometimes I watch it with my unexperienced friend and they, they, they will tell me, why does it you just escape? Well, it's not <laughs> yeah. that simple. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I, I just I appreciate the fact. I think it's a really good thing to have that. I think uh, having that knowledge and background and, and actually training sport, because a lot of time you do get it. You know, I'm not just saying just not just in the UK, but around the States. I know at one point they had a lot of uh, sort of boxing uh, judges coming across to the MMA, which, you know, it, it can kind of hinder it a little bit because they've, they've not had the experience in the, in this sort of MMA sort of world. But I think having some kind of background in fighting is definitely a something you should have. It certainly is. Uh, actually, uh, oh, sorry to interrupt. No, I was going to I was going to go on to another question, but if you've got something to add, Yuri. Yeah, I, I think yeah, there's an interesting thing uh, that, that's happening is that lately with the International uh, MMA Federation and uh, even with the Russian equivalent, which is the World MMA Association, yeah. they've started to train uh, the referees and the judges. And I've been certified by the German MMA Federation, which is a branch of the International MMA Federation, which is, I think, uh, supported by the UFC. Yeah. And uh, when I passed the certification, uh, there was a written exam, there was a comprehension exam, there was a judging uh, fight. Uh, I had to judge a fight and explain why I judged it like this, but there was also a practical part of it. And we had to go in the gym and to demonstrate that we knew, for example, 17 uh, submission and the, uh, the different variation on how to, to get to them and how to escape them. So I, I think a practical uh, exam is definitely a must for every referees and every judges to be really able to prove that they understand what's going on. Yeah. Okay, Yuri, my, my question uh, when I rudely interrupted you, I was wanting you yeah, to explain. I mean, <laughs> no. oh, yeah. so I I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my friend. So I, I was wanting to ask you, um, obviously, we've watched a lot of the M1 shows. I, I, myself as a commentator, you as a judge, with them using the rage. You know, you, you explained that um, in the first show in the mountains, they used a, just a normal ring, but now they use the rage, which would you, would you want to describe it and tell us as well how you think that that can alter a fight? Uh, yes, so usually I think most of the fights are held in a cage. Uh, some of the fights also in uh, some other countries might be held in a ring. And what M1 did is they created the, a mix of the two actually. So they call it the rage, which uh, has, I think, if I remember correctly, there's three ropes on the top, and on the bottom, it's uh, actually like a cage. Uh, the, I, I think the idea behind it is that they thought that the cage creates a lot of stalling when the fighters are, uh, are against, a, against a fence. So they say, okay, well, the rings creates less stalling, so let's use the top ropes. Yeah. But the problem that they had with the ring is that on the bottom, fighters would always find themselves going under the ropes. Yeah. And then the, fight, the, the referee had to either stop the action, bring them back in the middle of the ring, or try to pull them a little bit from underneath the ropes. And, uh, or sometimes the fighters would, would, would accidentally fell, feel, uh, fall through the ropes. Excuse me, I have French is my first language, not English, so sometimes <laughs> it's my words. So yeah, so fighters would sometimes fall through the ropes. And uh, so they say, okay, well, if we don't want the fighters to go underneath, let's just put the cage at the bottom and on the top, uh, let's use the rope to prevent the stalling. Uh, in my opinion, it's a very, very good uh, fighting surface. Uh, it sure it has advantages, disadvantage, but uh, overall, it's very difficult to say if one is better. You've seen both. I, 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 my personal opinion, um, and, and I've said this uh, as, I've, uh, as I've called the fights, I do find that that's, it works exactly how it's meant to. I think the fight's a lot, um, it doesn't get stalled as much on the fence. I think it's a lot quicker stood up. You know, you know you, if they get um, over by the ropes, it does get taken down. And I think the bottom bit works really, really well compared with a ring insofar as they can do the ground and pound against the fence. So from my experience, I would say that it works perfectly how it was designed to work. 
I totally agree with you. And I think, uh, as we were speaking before, uh, for the fighters, it's important to adapt to the rules. But uh, when you've never fought in a ring, and most of the time nowadays, I think most of the gyms, what they have are a cage or octagon or hexagon or how many, however many sides they, they want. But they also have to adapt to this. And I think it's a big, big difference. If you have a game plan that is pushing your opponents against the fence and grueling in from there, well, it might not work in a rage. Yeah, Jay, have you, have you fought in a, in a ring or have you got open cage? Yeah, early days, I fought in the ring. Um, obviously, things were a lot more fractured than less, but now it's pretty much universal. Everybody in the UK has a cage, but there are a lot of ring fighting done. From in the what early you've days. heard there, Jay, while well, me and you have discussed the rage and how it works with the not good on the bottom ropes, which I think is one of the, the only downfalls to a ring, how do you think that that is? Yeah, I, I'd love to try it myself. I think that was always, always the, the big fault of the ring. Yeah guys falling out and that stop start because you have to put them back in the centre and stuff. Um, but, you know, if you can eliminate that problem, like you say, you get the freer fight and we've all seen the wall on stall, guys get so good at it. I've been guilty of it myself, you know, and if you can eliminate that, it, should, it can make for good fights and, you know, M1 do have good fights. And Yuri talked about, again, you've got to acclimatise to whatever it is you're doing. I remember um, one of my good friends, training partners, uh, James Savile, who was going to fight in uh, Bangkok, in a ring, MMA rules with soccer kicks and, you know, we trained those rules. We didn't send him in. I trained him when he was on the ground. We trained the ring and I tried to kick him in the head, you know what I mean? Because Did you enjoy it, that? I did. <laughs> <laughs> he was really disappointed that he only got kicked in the head on the ground once. <laughs> it was a bit of a weird laugh. But like, you know, it, it was being specific in anything you do. You have to try and be as specific as possible. And like Yuri said, that, that might be a little bit more difficult, but certainly training and sparring in a ring is going to help under that. And if you're just going in, and thinking, yeah, I can go fight in a ring and I've never done it. You know, you will you go box to a boxer who's good at ring craft and you'll soon see the difference in, you know, what people can do when they're familiar with the fighting surface. Yeah, certainly. Have we got anything else for you, Uri? No, no, we'll like, ab absolute pleasure to uh, to speak to you, mate. No, it's been well, brilliant. It's a pleasure speaking with you guys. Anytime you, you need me, I'll be there for you. That's a great insight. Thank you very much, Yuri. Thank you, mate. Have a good evening. Bye. Cheers. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed the insight into the officials. I've been Ian M16 Butlin. And I've been Jamie the Haymaker Hey. Until next time, go out, MMU and Cage is in the shops. Buy a copy. <laughs>